Oh, thank you so much, Martha, for the, the wonderful introduction. It's a joy to be here with everyone. I'm coming to you from Melbourne here in Australia, where I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respect to their elders past, present and future and acknowledge that Indigenous sovereignty in Australia was never ceded. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I got the PowerPoint slides. Uh, talking about cheating, academic integrity, assessment security. Thank you so much for the plug for the book. I really do appreciate that. And do download PDF chapters from the library. I made sure the publisher would let you do that. So do that and don't go and buy a copy. The library copy is good enough. Okay. Before we get started, I just thought let's let's start off by being a bit positive. Um, let's Let's reflect on the fact that it's it's now 2023, and yes, we do have chat GPT, but this is the state of robot humor. This is the best that the robot can do. So I said, write a funny joke to use at the start of a talk. The topic of the joke should be why we should be optimistic about academic integrity, because you know, I thought let's let's outsource the the labor of the optimism to the machine. And it says, here's a joke you could use at the start of a talk on academic integrity. Why should we be optimistic about academic integrity? Because even if we're not always 100% honest, at least we'll still be better than politicians. At least we're still better than politicians. They're only about 50% honest on a good day. And then it tries to explain the joke because it's not a very good joke. So it says the joke plays on the common perceptions that politicians are not always truthful and uses it to make a lighthearted comparison to academic integrity and, and so on. Um, that's not a very good joke. I am someone who actually does comedy. I, if you were in Melbourne, I'd be plugging my comedy show to you for next week, getting you to all come along to it. Um, I've taken courses on comedy. I can tell you that's not a good joke. And you can take that as my authoritative opinion. Not a great joke. One of the ways we know it's not a great joke is it needed to be explained for us to get it. So not a good joke. And this is all to say, you know, there's been a lot of hubbub about chat GPT is going to come and the robot's going to take our essays or whatever. But it's not yet chuck your uh, thing in and get a perfect response. There have been people using these sorts of tools for a lot of good things, but it also produces a whole heap of crap. And I would you know, love to play a bit of let's, let's see what we can get chat GPT to do um, in the Q&A if you'd like to do that. And if you haven't played with ChatGPT, it's really the thing to be thinking about at the moment. It's a tool that will just kind of try and have a chat with you. Yes, students can use it to produce work, but people out there in the world of work are using it to do work for them. I'm using it to do work for me. You can ask it to play Dungeons and Dragons with you and it'll do that. You can ask it to write a limerick and it'll do that. Some more challenging things. Um, you can ask it to help you uh, decide on what sort of scientist you might want to hire. And I did that once and I had it tell me not to hire people of color. That was pretty sketchy. I thought, how on earth has that gotten through the, the guards that are supposed to be there? That's abhorrent. So I'm flagging a cause for optimism. We have a stay of execution right now. This technology isn't quite as amazing as it's going to get to be. However, it's the worst than it's that it's ever going to be. It's the least capable it'll ever be. So let's be optimistic. Okay. Now I've done the sort of reason for optimism. I'd like to do a bit of a disclaimer next. So here's, here's my disclaimer when I talk about uh, cheating. Firstly, I'm a standards-based assessment person. Now, in Australia, that's not at all a controversial thing to say. In the US, it's like, what are you talking about? I don't know in Scotland where you are with that. But in Australia, when we assess students, we specify what the standards are, the standards of achievement, and we assess students against those standards rather than against each other. It's not some sort of norm referenced or marking to a curve thing. Secondly, I support assessment for learning and academic integrity. There's an Australian rules football joke in there that you won't get at all based on the, the little diagram there. Extra points to anyone who can guess which AFL football team is mine. Um, 
this is to say that, you know, I've come through the assessment for learning side of things. I think that one of the most important things assessment does is support student learning. Thirdly, I think cheating is a symptom of broader social problems. Uh, if you have coming to this talk and you're thinking the cause of cheating is neoliberalism or students as consumers or large class sizes or some other macro social factor, I'm not going to disagree with you, but those aren't tractable problems for me. Those aren't things that I can influence. So I don't focus on them, but I'm not discounting their importance. Fourthly, Universities have a responsibility to try to prevent and detect cheating in Australia, and I believe in the UK as well, that's something that's legislated. We just got to do it. So we, we have to, this isn't optional stuff that I'm going to be talking about. I receive research funding from ed tech companies. I think we should ask more questions in around this sort of question in this space. I think there's a lot of corporate interests. Um, now, for me, the most relevant ones are I've received funding from Turnitin and Inspira. Uh, none of that is about this talk and, you know, it's only been on really specific projects. It's only been quite small sums of money. It's always good to ask. And finally, my mum helped me contract cheat in year four. So we had to do this poster on the differences between Australia and Canada. And I just was terrible. I couldn't figure out how to do a poster. Um, my mum did what I now believe to be too much of it. Really, she did most of it. And that was basically contract cheating, getting someone else to do all or part of the work for me. Um, later in life, I found out I've got aphantasia, like I've got no mind's eye. I can't visualize. I can't see my children's faces or a duck or a square or a sunset or whatever. There's nothing there. Uh, but at the time, I just thought I was terrible at this. If you want a hard-hitting documentary about the perils of contract cheating in the earlier years, there's an episode of Peppa Pig where Madame Gazelle sets the students this diorama task. And of course, they all go home and get their parents to do it for them. And then later on, they bring their dioramas in that they obviously haven't done and everyone just has a laugh about it. And that is also to say that our understandings of cheating are contextual and socially constructed. What's cheating in one context is not necessarily cheating in another. Okay, that's the disclaimer. I, I really hope that's the most boring part of this talk. Now on to the good stuff. Okay. For, I, I got three things that I really want to talk with you about and they're up here. I'm going to go through them in a lot more detail. But the three things are that cheating is changing and I think cheating is changing more and more quickly. And certainly our experiences this year with ChatGPT is uh, telling us that. It's really rapid. Secondly, that we've got to balance two things, a positive sort of academic integrity where we really try and equip students so they have the capability to do the work themselves and a desire to do so, and a more adversarial assessment security. And thirdly, that we need to think about how we address cheating in a bit of a layered approach. We want to change our unit of analysis and you will find out why there's a picture of cheese there. Okay, so on to the first point, that cheating's changing. Um, this is sort of a, a tale of the pandemic, I think. So over here on the left, we've got a quote from a study by Lancaster and Cotillon where they looked at requests on a website called Chegg to do work. So by students to get some work done in some STEM subjects. And they pretty well doubled over that early pandemic period. And what's really interesting is if you kind of track it here on the, uh, the share price chart in the middle. So this is the share price of Chegg over that period. Gee, they rocket up. They increased so much. At one point, I think this peak on the graph there Chegg was worth about 12 billion US dollars. That's billion with a B. By way of comparison, Turnitin was sold most recently a few years back for 1.6 billion US dollars. So it shows you where the money is in the market. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying Chegg's a cheating company. No Chegg spies in here make that claim. Not bold enough to go and do that. But certainly a lot of students have been using Chegg for cheating. To be clear, Chegg is a textbook rental company. Okay, we're clear. Good, we'll move on. Um, but I do definitely say that they provide industrial scale cheating services. And this is the only time I've like 
tagged a whole bunch of famous people in a tweet. I felt really cool doing that. Um, and the reason why I did this is there was a tweet about this prize for teachers that was hosted in the UNESCO headquarters. Um, and there were videos from all these famous people, including Gordon Brown and Joe Biden, uh, Ban Ki-moon and Hugh Jackman, talking about how great this prize was. And who paid for the prize? Chegg. So they're out there. They're trying to leg legitimise themselves. Cheating is changing on that sort of industrial scale, and they are trying really hard to be legit. They are reaching out to universities. They might have reached out to your university to say, hey, can we have a meeting? Can we talk about stuff? They want to seem legit. They're not. But we've got to remember that this sort of commercialised cheating is only the tip of the iceberg. The rest of the iceberg is people just getting friends and family to do work for them. Um, and got a couple of papers there that talk about that. So we know that, you know, prevalence of this commercialised cheating in Australia, at least I can say, but also the, the Audrey paper is uh, an international one that covers Europe. Um, in Australia, I can say it's about one in 10 students are engaging in contract cheating in a commercial sense, paying to get someone else to do work for them. But we know more people are getting friends and family to do that. And that's to say nothing of sort of specialist cheating technologies like this exam cheating calculator on the left there lets you type things into your friends during an exam, have a chat that goes via your phone. Um, in the middle, we've got one of these apps that lets you take a photo of some maths and it will try and solve it for you. And on the right there, we've got an exam cheating earpiece. So the technology of cheating is getting more advanced and it's getting pushed out there. And of course, open AI and, you know, chat GPT has become the, the huge one that's really dominated the media. Um, here on the left, there's a bit of a quote from a paper. It's in preprint, not peer reviewed, but a lot of the stuff in this space is in that sort of preprint stage at the moment where the researchers evaluated the performance of chat GPT on the United States medical licensing exam. And they found it performed at or near the passing threshold for all three exams. Now, that's, that's huge. Um, on the right there is a piece of art that I tried to get uh, OpenAI's art generator, which is DALI 2. Uh, I tried to get it to generate some art for me. So I asked for an Android robot dressed as a medical doctor wearing a lab coat and a stethoscope sitting an exam on a computer. And we got that. That's okay. I mean, that the thing is, that's a bespoke piece of art that's never been seen before by anyone. Um, the outputs that were given through to this uh, medical licensing exam are bespoke, brand new things. It's it's new stuff. So so being in that old mindset of sort of content matching, text matching, uh, you know, turn it in or capture this those sort of tools will not work in this, in this new world to spot this sort of work. There's a comment in the chat that art AI can't do fingers, and I agree with you. There are some features of sort of um, humanness that are very disconcerting when AI tries to do them. Um, something that I think doesn't get enough press is sort of hacking and cheating in online exams. Um, Use of remote proctored exams is big in some places, but not all. There's controversy around remote proctored exams and all that. I think um, the literature on can people actually cheat in them is, is really interesting. People are now doing studies where they're trying to cheat in remote proctored exams. And yeah, some people really are able to. Um, there's a comment in the chat about old school cheating still being around. Yeah, it, it really is still around and we can't ignore that. It, it, old school cheating has been a thing for 1300 years since the first exams, which were for civil service in China. You know, people used to pass cheating technology down through the generations. Uh, families would invest in a cheating garment with all the answers written on it and these, these things would cost a lot of money. So I'd use it and then my kid would use it and then their kid and so on through the generations. For as long as there have been exams, there's been exam cheating. 
but this new technologized world of, of e-cheating is it's somewhat different because it doesn't sort of require any cleverness or industriousness or hard work on the part of students. It can be packaged up and shared freely, bought and sold. It can be anonymous. It's pushed and that's something to get your head around. So uh, it's easy to think of someone going to Google and typing in, I want to cheat. How do I buy an assignment? Something like that. The reality is, yes, that's a thing. But there's also the case of being on Twitter and typing, I hate stats and getting people market cheating services to you that are specific to your challenges. You didn't ask for cheating. You were just expressing your difficulties, but you get cheating marketed to you. Um, it usually rates higher on web searches than legitimate help. And this is sad. So at times when I search, say, Harvard referencing, I get cheating sites with guides on how to do Harvard referencing that come well before legitimate sources. It evolves at the pace of technology. And my gosh, just the past few weeks, we've seen that. And it's never more than a web search away. So all of this is to say that cheating is changing and it's changing really rapidly. Second point I want to talk about is a way to think about it, to, to balance two things. And they are academic integrity and assessment security. So academic integrity being the positive, educative, values-based mission and assessment security being more adversarial, maybe punitive and, and evidence-based, as in we need evidence of have students done the work themselves. These two things are intention, but they're not a dichotomy. And that's really important. There's been some, some fairly simplistic thinking about this over the past few years that we've either got to trust the students and any attempts to, you know, ensure that they haven't cheated will cause cheating or will drive students to want to cheat or whatever. There's been kind of a polar end there. And then on the other side, there's been some fairly negative and sad views that we can't trust students. They're just going to cheat if we don't surveil the hell out of them. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to just monitor and surveil. And I'd like you to come and meet me somewhere in the middle where we say, yes, we do sadly need to ensure that students haven't cheated, but that can't be our only approach because ultimately we don't want to graduate students who didn't cheat just because they knew we were watching. What a terrible world that would be. Um, on the top right there, you've got something from the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating. Um, and this has the say no, and oh, I don't know about say no, has feelings of say no to drugs, which I'm not quite sure how well that worked. I'm more in favor of some very frank conversations with students about cheating. Um, there's a, a mention in there of blackmail in the chat, and that's part of the conversations I would have with students, you know, rather than saying, don't contract cheat, you'll get caught, it's bad. I'd be saying, my gosh, contract cheating sites, there is evidence that they blackmail students, um, that you might get your assignment, you might pass, but then later on, they'll come back to you demanding money, some of them, not all of them, but sometimes demanding money or else they're going to reveal to your institution that you've cheated and they will be able to find you. You're not clever enough that you can make yourself invisible. They will be able to find you. So having chats about that, um, you know, our research center has bought more contract cheating assignments than anyone else in the world, to my understanding, because we get them marked and we see what the quality of them is like and we see if our university markers can detect them. And most of the time, our university markers fail contract cheating assignments that in, in our research studies. So you know, those sort of real talk conversations with students. And in the bottom right, we've got sort of another end of uh, assessment security, a really I'd say probably humiliating um, a case where, you know, people are really stripped down and just monitored, uh, spread apart from each other. That's, that's not a, an assessment world I'd like to be in. That's an in, a military entrance exam in India. There's a question about, is there any firm evidence on blackmail? There is. The study is by... I believe John York and Leslie Sefcik are two of the authors, and it comes out of Curtin Uni in Australia. It was last year or the year before. So 
when we say academic integrity, I am using an understanding from the International Center for Academic Integrity. And they have these fundamental values of honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility, and courage. Surely these are things we want all of our students to, to have regardless. Um, these are good things, even if they did nothing for cheating, but they are associated with reductions in cheating. We also know that um, students having difficulties, no, not difficulty, students having academic integrity breaches, might be associated with professional integrity breaches later in life. Um, there's one study in health professions, I believe it was in medicine, that found that students with more academic integrity mishaps went on to have more professional integrity mishaps. So this is this is valuable stuff, even if it didn't lead to reduced rates of cheating, but it does. And on the other side, we've got this assessment security thing, which is what we do to harden assessment against attempts to cheat, you know, detection, and evidencing attempts to cheat, making cheating more difficult. Um, there's a comment in the chat about uh, academic integrity for staff too, a value or communicative act in showing students us as staff are committed to it. And I really agree with that. I think that's really important. In the old days, uh, when we used to run like academic skills workshops for students, um, it was found, I think as far back as the 90s, that the isolated academic skills workshop wasn't as effective as incorporating academic skills within the disciplines, actually getting the academics who are doing the teaching to incorporate it into, you know, their everyday teaching and language. And I think that's the way we've got to think about academic integrity as well. There's no vaccination against academic integrity. There's no module that you can tick the box and it's done. It's something that needs to be part of everyone's talk. Uh, I've got a colleague at the University of New South Wales, Kath Ellis, and she always says, everyone is an academic integrity officer of the university. You know, it's all of our responsibility all the time. Keep it in the talk. And, you know, there's a comment in there about integrity issues in science as well. Great way of talking about it with science students, talking about fabrication of data, talking about the ways that it's found out, talking about the problems that it creates for society. You know, I'd be surprised if uh, people aren't dying thanks to poor quality science that's out there that's that's been fabricated and taken through to treatments that don't work for people. So really great opportunities to talk with students about it. And this takes it away from a sort of a pure academic busy work thing to being something that, that's real in the real world, authentic to the discipline. So really addressing cheating requires balancing these two things, the academic integrity approach, the positive, educative, proactive, and the assessment security approach, where we do sadly detect, punish, Punishment's an interesting one. Um, for me, if you cheat and I give you zero for it, there's no punishment there. Punishment begins after that because the zero for the work you didn't do is an active assessment. Um, and being proactive or reactive, you know, trying to design stuff so it's robust or trying to react to cheating hotspots. And it's about thinking sort of crime prevention balanced against policing or surveillance, if, you, if that metaphor works for you. So it's a balance, it's a tension, it's not a dichotomy. Um, and yeah, protecting the value of degrees, as is mentioned in the chat there, totally agree. Um, it, it really is. It's about protecting the value of the degrees for everyone, including people out there in society. And it's also about protecting society against people who aren't competent. Um, in Australia, the memory of the Christchurch earthquake a few years back is still very big in our minds. And um, very sadly, the architect that designed one of the big towers where a lot of people died had fraudulently obtained his degree through various types of cheating. Um, and I wonder if he legitimately obtained his degree or not obtained one, whether those people would have died. You know, it's about really protecting society and our students. Um, yeah, the issues of poor academic practice on a postgrad certificate of academic practice as well. I have been there too with, with students and that's a very challenging one. Um, so I'm going to move on to talking about the need for a layered approach. So when I say a layered approach, I'm talking this. Um, 
when we were at the start of the pandemic and we were thinking, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Because because these masks aren't perfect and hand washing's not perfect. And when we got vaccines, they weren't perfect either. And ventilation wasn't perfect. Heaps of things. You could still get the coronavirus in, in that context. Um, where we got to as a society was really a Swiss cheese model, a Swiss cheese approach, building off the work of reason. Um, it's this idea that you have multiple imperfect interventions that when layered together are better than any single intervention. And that's the way I'd love us to think about cheating. There is no perfect intervention against cheating. What we need is a range of different types of interventions that when we layer them together, do a good enough job. We'll never be perfect. Over here on the right, there's a bit from a chapter by Rundle, Curtis and Claire, who were the first ones to come up with that idea of let's do a Swiss cheese model. And their chapter is worth a look. Um, before we go further, though, I want to talk just a little bit about assessment because ultimately the assessment security thing is about securing assessment, tautological, not very smart. Um, and I want to say if it's if the assessment isn't as valid and reliable as you can make it within reason, it's not worth securing. You probably want to go work on validity and reliability first. So when I use those terms, when I say re reliability, I'm talking about the extent to which it assesses consistently, might be across different cohorts or time periods or assesses. When I say validity at a simple level, the extent to which it assesses what it purports to assess. Um, and in higher ed, we do surprisingly little work on this. We might want to do a little bit more work on are we actually assessing what we claim to assess before we try and secure it. This is a first order concern. And the stuff I'm about to talk about is really second order concerns. Okay, so talking about layers, I want to say some layers are imperfect and some others are just all holes. So what layers are all holes? Well, one of them is banning essays. There was some really simplistic talk about it, like, like, guys, guys, I've got it. I've got it. We're going to ban essays and it's going to stop the essay mills. Like genius, but it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> we called them essay mills out of convenience, but con the whole contract cheating industry, this multi-billion dollar space produces bespoke work for students doesn't matter if it's an essay or a report or a poem or whatever else, they'll, they'll make bespoke stuff for you. Authentic assessment won't solve contract cheating. Now, before you ask, I love authentic assessment. I write research papers about authentic assessment. Authentic assessment should be our default practice. We should need a really strong reason to not do authentic assessment, but cheating isn't a reason to do authentic assessment. Um, Contract cheating sites can and do produce authentic assessment. If anyone comes to you and says, I've cracked it, my task is cheat proof because it's authentic, they're, they're kidding themselves. Uh, there's a great paper there by Kath Ellis and colleagues where they actually look at a whole bunch of contract cheating work and see which of it is authentic and heaps of it was authentic. Short turnaround times, they don't solve it. So if you're thinking we're going to stop cheating by giving students just a day to do the task, Cheating sites and, you know, other technologies that are coming through now are more efficient than honest students at doing work. So short turnaround times don't work. Individualized tasks, they don't work either. They're not going to stop students from using these sort of bespoke cheating um, products. And thinking that your task is cheat proof is the most dangerous of all. All right. But just remember, I'm pro-authentic assessment, just not for this reason. One bit of a pivot or an angle on authentic assessment is authentic restrictions. So when we set restrictions on our tasks, we need to enforce those restrictions. Um, if you say an exam is closed book, it better stay closed book because the way you design a closed book task, it's ruined if people change it into an open book exam. They just look up all the stuff you didn't want them to look up. Each restriction that you set like that, each time you say you can't do this and I've designed the task around you not doing this, means you've got to enforce them not doing it. Another way to think about it is we might look at how people do this task in the world of the discipline, the profession, work, industry. 
and say, what resources, tools, collaboration do they have access to when they're doing it there? And what reason do we have to deny people those? Because every denial that you do, you've got to enforce, and that's hard. There's an example there of uh, David Kellerman's engineering exam, where he just says, engineers collaborate, so I'm giving you a Teams channel to do the exam in. You do the exam individually, but you can talk to people on the Teams chat. And the students talk to each other on the Teams chat, and they you know, ask, where did we talk about this in the notes? And they refer each other to the bits. Um, really thinking about what do people have access to when they're doing the task in the world of your discipline. Remote proctoring. Okay, it can be an effective layer. It has pros and cons. Uh, really quick summary here. There is evidence that proctoring probably deters cheating and there's claims that it's effective or ineffective at detecting cheating. Deterring cheating seems to be students get worse marks in remote proctored exams than unproctored exams. And there's at least a dozen studies out there that show that effect. But there's also studies out there that say, hey, I tried to cheat in remote proctored exams and here's how, and it worked. So mixed evidence there. And there's concerns about privacy, surveillance, anxiety, distrust, discrimination, and even the continuation of the exam. Some people don't like exams. Um, and that that's a challenge. So mm, if we're looking for a perfect layer, absolutely not. Far from it. If we're looking for one layer in the Swiss cheese model, maybe if you think the pros are worth the cons. Um, there's a comment in the chat that all students now have access to chat GPT or similar apps, and they do. Um, and they will in their professional lives. And the challenge for us is how do we design assessment that can work if someone has access to it? You know, do we do that through saying you have to acknowledge chat GPT? Do we do it through tricks that are probably only going to work in the short term, like um, chat GPT isn't aware of the year 2022 very much. It, it seems to end its knowledge somewhere in 2021 on most things. Do we set all of our assessment to include case studies of things that happened very recently. So it won't be inside the large language model. I don't think that's going to last in the long term. A lot of little hacky approaches that are about denial, but then I think probably in the future, we're going to treat it like the calculator uh, and say, we, we know that you have this and we're trying to set tasks that, yeah, require you to use it, but then expand on that. We also might want to actually ask students what they want to do and what they would cheat in. Um, 10,000 Australian students were asked what types of tasks would a student be more or less likely to contract cheat? Here's what they gave. You'll see short turnaround time and heavily weighted tasks. They said, yeah, going to cheat on that. Up here, reflections and Viva's interactive oral assessment, quite low. In brief, reflection I have concerns about from an integrity perspective. We rarely think about faked reflective practice as an integrity issue, but in my opinion, it's a really serious one. And if you want to read some papers about that, there's a good one called Faking It or Hating It. And there's another good one called They Liked It If You Said That You Cried, which says it all. You know, we, we fake reflection. Interactive oral assessment's really interesting. We did a small scale study where we tried to get students to fake interactive oral assessment. We gave them some cheated work. We said, we want you to pretend as if you did this yourself. We had some students who hadn't done that. Like they, they had legitimate work of their own and our markers could tell who were the cheats every single time. We didn't publish that because getting it right every single time sounds a bit dubious. So we want to replicate and do some other stuff, but I do have a lot of uh, hope for interactive oral assessment. There's a great, uh, project at Griffith University in Australia that's produced a bit of a guide on that. You can find that through Googling Griffith Interactive Oral, oral Assessment. But there's many things that are beyond any individual. Countering the persuasion put forward by cheating purveyors. Um, site blocking. In Australia, we block a bunch of cheating sites. I don't think that's going to do much for things like ChatGPT, though, because that's legitimate uh, sort of AI tools that people use for good deplatforming cheating. So actually going out there and where cheating services are being marketed, getting Google, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal to say, no, we're not going to do this. And, you know, there has been some success with that. YouTube 
used to have a lot of influencers promoting a site called EduBirdie, a cheating site. And they don't anymore because the BBC did an investigation and then pressure was put on YouTube and they don't let influencers promote cheating anymore. Improving detection rates through training, staffing and technology, those things can work. And amnesties or even just ways for students to come forward and say, hey, I've done something wrong and I want to make it right. We need to make it someone's job as well. This is something that needs to be resourced because we know most cheating doesn't get to the point of being detected and proven. There's no hard number for that in the literature. I can't find one. But if you asked me for a gut response, I reckon it's something in the order of 1% to 10% of cheating gets caught, probably closer to 1%. We know a lot of cheating that does get seen just gets ignored. Uh, why don't we follow it up? In one large scale Australian study, it was because it was seen as too much work and too hard to prove. Kath Ellis from UNSW, who I'm name dropping again, says you've got to make it someone's job. There's got to be people whose job it is to focus on this, because this is really becoming expert practice. So we do need support centrally for this. And my final big push is to go programmatic or go home. Think about the degree universities award degrees. We cut them up into these little units, course, module, subject things, but we award degrees. That's what we certify for society. Assessment security needs to function at the level of the degree. We need to map out the assessment across our degrees and say, what are the key summative moments that really matter? If you heard me talk about interactive oral assessment before and were thinking, but Phil, that sounds resource intensive and we can't do it. I'm there with you. We can't do it all the time. Maybe we can't do it in your class, but somewhere in the degree, we've got to have the ability to have a chat with a student about what they're capable of. We've got to be able to shift some resourcing around. We might say, well, what they do in the first year doesn't matter a lot to our judgment of whether they've completed the degree and achieved the degree level outcomes honestly. But what they do in the final semester really matters. So we might shift some resourcing around and we might focus on developing their academic integrity capability more at the start and really assuring the assessment security at the end. So that's my sort of three big points that cheating's changing, that we need to balance a positive academic integrity and a more adversarial assessment security. And we've got to get a layered approach. So really changing that unit of analysis from perfect assessment security in a cheat-proof task to layers of imperfect approaches that we think about across an entire degree. Thank you so much.